To begin, two quotes from the English philosopher John Locke. I have always thought the actions of men the best interpreters of their thoughts. And an excellent man, like precious metal, is in every way invariable. A villain, like the beams of a balance, is always varying, upwards and downwards. Solve the World, a fictional adventure told in 100 episodes. <laughs> Episode 94 Found in the Mist. On the ground beside Jen, Father Thomas repeated his desperate question. Jen, what's happened to you? <laughs> you, you almost killed me! Mr. Smith cackled out, smiling ear to ear. <laughs> Is it really you, Jennifer? You look so different, and, and now... Father Thomas outstretched a hand, caressed Jen's face, as if her soul would spill out through her skin once touched. From the ground, still wheezing and laughing, Mr. Smith reached out his hand. <laughs> the name's Smith. <laughs> I presume you are the one and only. Jen was unaware of what he was offering. She was unsure of Father Thomas. She was unsure what she had just done. She was unsure of who she was. <laughs> Come on, shake my hand. It's okay. No one's going to hurt you. <laughs> But, ooh, boy. If you knew who I am and what I've done, you'd be as impressed with yourself as I am. <laughs> Gee willikers. <sighs> you got me hooting and hollering <laughs> like an old man. <laughs> Slowly, Jen outstretched her hand with trepidation, giving in and soggily shaking the man's hand. Mr. Smith popped himself up from the ground. Now, apparently all better, unfazed and utterly unscared of this stranger that nearly successfully strangled the life out of him. He caught his reflection in a cabin mirror, lifting his head so he could check out the sweet new bruising colors coming into the surface on his neck. What would you like? Some coffee? Soda? Tea? <laughs> Whiskey? <laughs> Jen had nothing to say. She stood, bent over, hands holding the weight of her soul on the top of the chair in front of her. Come, child, sit, Father Thomas pleaded. He put his hands delicately on either side of Jen's waist and pushed her to the table. Once there, as if she were some kind of marionette, he placed a hand on top of her head and guided her down into a seat. Mr. Smith disappeared for a moment, returned then with a near full bottle of whiskey and three shot glasses. He took a seat, poured the shots, and sent one down the hatch. Much to Jen's surprise, Father Thomas followed suit. This was a surprising enough action to cause the mute Jen to return from the land of the speechless. You drink? She said. There always come times when it's more right than wrong to make exceptions. Mr. Smith nudged the third shot glass Jen's way. She took it and swigged down the brown liquid. 
There is a firestorm that often takes root at the most dubious of times. That firestorm, of course, is known to history as the Giggle Bus. It was indeed the oddest of times for Agent Smith, Father Thomas, and Jennifer Dash to find themselves breathlessly convulsing on the back of the Giggle Bus. But here they were. The laughter continued and the alcohol flowed. This was an unexpected result for Jen, to say the least. One does not usually enter into frivolity with the person you just attempted to assassinate mere seconds ago. But alas, such is the world. All too often we don't get what we deserve, and we don't reap what we sow. Therefore, it's a fitting time as any to deviate from Jen's chronological path for just a moment. Just this one moment. The name John Locke is most often associated with an English philosopher of the 17th century. He remains known to scholars and burgeoning academics alike for the host of groundbreaking work in the realms of the self, political philosophy, and of course the notion of empiricism. To the philosophical novice, Locke is known primarily for his coining of the Latin phrase tabula rasa. Locke had a certain stalwart faith in empiricism, that is, the theory that all knowledge comes entirely, absolutely, from sensory experience. This rigid faith led him to surmise that we are all born as empty vessels. Tabula rasa translates as blank space. An embrace of this magnitude towards absolute empiricism leads to many further tentacly beliefs. A baby is a glass jar. The child will come to contain much, but what it is filled with will come to labeling. We therefore could only ever find our identity, our personal self-worth, through our experiences. A baby that is filled with vitriol, hate, evil, can never be anything but. As one can see quite clearly, this faith in tabula rasa makes the young, impressionable years of the soul even more important than we all already intuitively understand them to be. Locke spent years wrestling and mining the depths of education. He came to believe that the proper raising of young people was absolutely vital to the integrity of the state and the well-being of the individual person. Furthermore, John Locke championed a term called associationism. Since in his mind, a child is an empty vessel, the first thing you put in that vessel will be the most important, for those first things will hold the most weight above them. Locke argues, for instance, that loving parents should never let a maid teach a child that there are goblins hiding in the darkness. The maid may have the best of intentions, sure, wanting only for the child to stay under the covers in bed at bedtime, but alas, the child now, until death, will associate the darkness with demons. Even if the child, as an adult, understands the stupidity of such a proclamation, for we all know there are no such things as goblins, inevitably the child turned adult will associate the darkness with evil, only bad. It is easy then, from this talk of empiricism, tabula rasa, and associationism, to see how modern psychology evolved. Locke trailblazed a path for the likes of Sigmund Freud, who suggested that introspection and understanding how early experiences have wired your conscious and subconscious life can cure any number of personal ills. While being, generally speaking, unfamiliar with the work of John Locke, Jen intuitively and fundamentally disagreed with the concepts of tabula rasa and associationism. If those ideals were true realities, hard-as-rock precepts, then she was doomed. 
her empty vessel would have been filled with years and years of darkness. Her first associations were all pictureless hallucinations of an unstimulated mind. Locke says her blank slate was filled with the scribblings of a personal holocaust. We've seen Jen suffer through endless wrestlings with her sense of self-identity. Solving the world, in large part, has always been about solving herself. But up until now, really, just now, the mystery for Jen has always been one of, who am I? If she's merely a conglomeration of her experiences, then Jen knows exactly who and what she is. There's nothing there to decipher. No mystery whatsoever. On the other hand, as Jen has subconsciously believed since day one that the soul is something eternal, something beyond mere experience, then, well, there's plenty to discover about oneself. The question of who are you becomes the spiraling epic that asks questions, not just of the self, but of the one that self comes from. In short, who am I evolves into what was I made to be, which subsequently morphs into who made me, which ends with who made my maker. Jen believed she had a soul. She believed that she had a little something something inside. There was magic in the nature of man. We are not born blank. We are born with stuff in the trunk already. The fun of life is watching everyone's different pre-programmed stuff interact and bounce off the experiences of life. This is what Jen had believed. This is why she was shaken when she presumably killed Tiff. Jennifer Dash intuitively believed in good people and bad people. Good people didn't kill. That's rule number one, after all. Joseph Further's list was not a rule book. It was a litmus test. If you break these, then you must not really be made up of the good stuff. The pre-programmed stuff. The stuff of good people just isn't in you. This was Jen's secret fear. Then came the philosophy of cleansing. Sometimes, bad things happen. Certain experiences gunk up the gears. Tar sticks to the soul, leeches onto it. That's where forgiveness comes in. Jen's doppelganger pushed her to do that in the little room, once upon a time. That led Jen to push Atticus to do so likewise. Forgiveness was a way out for Jen. If you accidentally broke the rules, then maybe forgiveness would once again clean you so that you could pass the litmus test. You could still claim to have good stuff inside of you. But now, as Jen continues to ward off her Balaam addiction and guilt with shot after shot, alongside an assassin and a Benedict Arnold, she wonders, if Locke is wrong, if we're born one way or another, then she was born to be a murderer. That just now proved itself certain for the first time. She tried to kill Smith, straight up. In truth, he saved her life. The ocean squall would have toppled the single-manned Orion no matter what. Jen would have sank to the bottom of the ocean. Her lungs, <gasps> right now, would be filled with salt water. Her carcass would be nibbled on by little fishes. And perhaps her soul would join all the other fallen sailors of yore. Maybe she'd reunite with old Jorge Robles. Maybe. Instead, here she is, as alive as ever, saved by a creeper named Smith. And how did she intend to pay back her savior? By murdering him. Straight up. This wasn't like Tiff. This wasn't self-defense. You couldn't just scrub this one out. This wasn't just tar. A little self-forgiveness doesn't make this one go away. What defense could Jen's lawyer heart give for this one? If you're born with junk in the trunk of your mind, then Jennifer Dash just proved who she was. She was a villain. A bad guy. Thinking about it only made it worse. To know Jen was to put your life in danger. Those closest to her were all either dead or turned evil. Tiff. Tiff's brother. Lorna von Schloss. Marshall Winston. Uh, the kid. The, the, the one the Babbitt killed. Uh, you know, the, the one you found, old girl. Uh, in Liechtenstein. Uh, the, 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 the one in the sewers. Gosh, the boy, the... Really? What's his name? How, how could you have forgotten his name? His name, he, 
He's dead now. Babbitt... Babbitt slaughtered him. His name... Uh... What's his name? His name... What the frick is his name? Why can't you remember, old girl? His name, his name. What's the boy's name? A devilish thought crossed Jen's mind then. What if I really am the villain? What if I always have been? The bad guys aren't born knowing they're bad. Probably, uh... <sighs> what is his name? Look at the story. Look at the direction it points. It's always been a straight arrow. Things started bad, and they got worse. Madness, more fully than ever before, was finding a cubbyhole in the back of Jen's mind. It had grappling hooks now, and it was intent on taking the hill. The walls of Jen's mind were being attacked. There was a way out, though. An easy one. A way to stop from becoming the next 666, numbered man, or child-sacrificing Lilith Babbitt. It was easy. Except... Associationism. Except tabula rasa. Kill the idea of the pre-incarnate soul. If Jen abandoned all hope of having some sort of incorporeal spirit, then she could breathe easy. For now, in this late hour, the notion of the soul damned her. It told her in a whisper, if you were meant to be better, you wouldn't kill. You wouldn't surround yourself with evil and death. Therefore, said the soul belief, you were made to be bad. Maybe all this wandering was just a lark, a long twisty road to the discovery that you are a child, not of the angels, but of the devil. You are the shining man's child. That, that, <laughs> that was the madness. Go down that road and go insane. The way out was with John Locke. You, old girl, are neither good nor bad. You were not really responsible for your actions. You got this way only through experience. You were born, just like every other person, blank. The world has written your story, written your heart's song. Some of it's good, most of it's bad. You tried to kill Smith, because that's what experience had taught you to do. It was easy. Easier, at least. So then, abandon all hope beyond hope of eternity and fate. What do you do next? Be a pragmatist. Jen. 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 Jen! 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 Jen looked up, tried to focus her eyes on Smith and Thomas. Not one to hold your liquor, are you? said Thomas. Nah. Ah. Uh. <laughs> replied Jen. Maybe we should all get some rest. Talk tomorrow, said Thomas. We do that, we lose another day piddling out here. Smith caught Jen's eyes and wouldn't release her from his stare. Jennifer... Where were you going? Japan. Why, child? I'm out of Balaam. Japan. That... that might work. I have a couple of contacts there, Smith said to Thomas. You're... whoa, whoa. Wait. You're going to let me go there? You still think we're the bad guys? If we wanted you dead, we would have let you die in the storm. Yeah, but... Why were you chasing me? I was hired to keep you safe, Smith said, a half lie. You didn't kill the Gandalf? Uh, uh, repeat that? You didn't kill Gandalf? The wizard? The, uh, the white guy. Four, four legs in Slovenia. You know, <laughs> my friend. I think you've had too much now, child, Father Thomas said but did nothing. The lights turned on then in Smith's head. Ah, the dog, your dog. Yeah, my sweet doggy. No, uh, that wasn't my people. Who are your people, exactly? 
Just some ladies and gentlemen that want to take over the world. <laughs> Doesn't everyone? So, Japan then. You get some sleep, Jen. Father Thomas, would you set a course for us? Of course. Jen didn't hear anything after her last words. She had collapsed on the table, unconscious. Once there was a world that had a kingdom in the cloud. Once there were many, don't kill. many different countries that lived in the Two. valleys below. Don't all of all yourself in sexual conduct of any sort. It was believed that the kingdom was ruled by one of the three. gods of creation. Don't idolize anyone. The great anything. mountain Pelagus, at its zenith, reached up to the Four. high door entrance don't owe anyone into anything. the kingdom in the clouds. From time Five. to time, intrepid men teased death by enduring the trek up the mountain. Six. No one ever don't came wait alive. Many bodies Seven. are found at the base Always of the sun, as even when you don't feel the kingdom's walls. The rumor circulated Eight. among one escape tribe, know before and over and generations became into. embedded as an eternal truth. Nine. The tribe believed Make that friends when everywhere. one venture don't to trust one friend over a god who dwells above, that adventuresome Ten. spirit must People offer will the god a gift. Want to if find that out god does not approve of the gift, he destroys the climber. But if the gift is accepted, the believer lives forever amidst the kingdom in the clouds. <laughs> We become more of that over time. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Jen, wake up. Jen, I'm sorry to wake you, but there's, there's something outside. She hadn't remembered, but from the table, Father Thomas had walked Jen to her bed. It had only been a few hours. It was now just past dawn. The boat was anchored, unmoving. Why? Jen sat up. Her head was splitting open. Father Thomas offered a tall glass of water and three aspirin. Jen greedily took it. Get yourself ready and come outside. Outside? What could be outside? It's the middle of nowhere. Being a monumental, world-shaking event, it was a humble sight. In almost all respects, this event, which was now appearing simultaneously in thousands of places on Earth, was larger and more important than the nuclear blasts and the worldwide plague. Those events were all part and parcel with human history. Since the dawn of mankind, there had always been disease, and there had always been war. The nukes and the lonely plague were the same old, same old, just on a larger scale than ever before. But this, this third event, a true event horizon, was something utterly different. In the end though, perhaps rather ironically, all three, the nukes, the plague, and this, did just one thing, they took lives. Jen found herself standing on the bow of the floating craft. It was foggy. Super foggy. Visibility was less than ten feet or so in any direction. Thomas and Smith were also outside sucking in the morning air, staring at it, talking while they remained unable to avert their eyes. How? Father Thomas said. You want to find out? What do you mean? Climb it. See what happens. It took Jen's eyes a moment to grasp what she was beholding. She thought at first she was seeing it wrong. A ladder. It stood ascending deep into the thick fog above. White. All white. But the trick of it was, it stood four or five feet above the surface of the calm sea. To the untrained eye, it looked like it was hovering, somehow unstuck from the force of gravity. Touch it. Go ahead. Smith encouraged Father Thomas. The boat was docked right up next to the ladder. Father Thomas followed orders, walked out to the side of the boat closest to the ladder, and reached out. Slowly. It was hard. A little cold. Smooth. And sturdy. Thomas even gave it a little tug, to test to see if it was buoyed somehow to a floating surface somewhere out of sight. Nope. It didn't budge. It seemed firm. Easily able to hold his weight, if he so chose. Smith finally took his eyes off the monolith. He turned to Jen and said, Want to climb it? She didn't. That was not the pragmatic thing to do. The three decided that this ladder must be connected to some tall oil platform. Those things were ginormous, after all. 
The giant platform was likely 200 feet in the air, hiding just behind the universal veil of fog. And so they went back below deck and left. No one of the three attempted to climb the ladder that day. They continued on their journey to the shores of Japan. They'd get there in due time. While they sped over the seas of the Pacific, millions around the world were discovering their own ladders, appearing amidst the universal din of mist, rising upward into the unknown above. The first person on Earth to see a ladder was the girl, the one who lived on a remote island off the Tierra del Fuego archipelago. She, unknown to Jen and Thomas and Smith, took courage and climbed her ladder. Others, some out of desperation, some out of curiosity or boredom, others still out of greedy hope, ascended. Multitudes from every country on Earth bore witness to their friends, relatives, lovers and enemies taking ascent. A ladder, left alone, even one that's apparently floating four to five feet off the ground, is quite unassuming. It doesn't force you to climb it. It doesn't ask you to do anything. But once you decide to engage it, well, then it becomes something of a prophetess. You see, there was always one of two consequences that befell the brave individual who chose to climb one of these white ladders. You either fell, how, why, no one knows, or you didn't. There would have been tales of this time, great tales. A smashing great tradition of retelling what the ladders did. Fantastic fables and folklores would be written as to why some climbed the ladder, never to return, and others ascended only to be proven unfit, either spiritually or physically perhaps, and fell from some great height to their death on Earth. One thing was true. Once you decided to climb, you never returned to Earth's surface alive. As it turned out, no one would tell tales of the ladders. All records of its existence would simply cease to exist. In three months' time, the ladders will disappear with the fog, and the world will not remember them. In fact, all accounts of any activity during these three months will simply evaporate. Future generations will look back and become perplexed as to why there remains a gap in the past. A small little period wherein no internet activity is documented. No newspapers seem to be published. No journal entries. Nothing. I'll tell you the secret. It's Croatoan. Finally, at the late hour, Croatoan descends. Smith, Father Thomas whispered. Yes? Why are you doing this? Doing what exactly? Letting Jen choose our path. I, I, I can't get in contact with my people. Then why aren't you taking Jen to them? Because she's such a lovely human being. This was not a lie. The truth, however, was built deeper in Mr. Smith's consciousness. He had fallen in love with Jennifer Dash after hearing of Father Thomas's regal tales of her lore. Upon nearly dying at her hands, Smith concluded that this girl had everything he ever wanted. His love, like so many loves on this sad earth, was wholly selfish. He found in her form someone that would give him all the things he desired. She was the most wanted person on earth, and she was beautiful, and she was fearless. Those were fantastic features. Attributes such as those made Jennifer Dash appear quite tasty, but what took Smith from mere lust to lurid expectation was that Jen was eminently controllable. She'd sold her body and mind to the drug Balaam. If he controlled her supply, he'd control her. With a few turns of the screw, he could have her for himself and reap all the benefits of her position. Forget Spencer. Screw the shroud. Smith was going for it all. Go big or go home, right? So 
Soul of the World is written, produced, performed, and edited by me, Dante Stack. All the sound effects and music you hear on this episode and every other episode of Solve the World are appropriately attributed on our show notes page at DanteStack.com. Guys, if you want to hear more from me, and you don't care what genre it is you hear me talk about, then check out my other podcast, 365 Honest Questions About the Bible. As I've told you before, the general premise is to look at the Bible, and rather than present it as something that I'm an expert on, I present you with my questions about it. Sometimes the questions are a big deal, and they take me to the verge of serious doubt. Other times, they're kind of silly. I've tried to make that show interesting both to the atheist, as well as the devout Christian. And, of course, everyone in between. So check it out. Uh, you'll find it on iTunes or DanteStack.com or anywhere else you download your podcasts from. Once again, the name is 365 Honest Questions. 